from Hollywood, I'm Martin Grove, welcoming you to our Screen Dollars podcast, Box Office Autopsy. Right now, we'll look at the movie marketplace and analyze how things are going and where they're going sharing some opinions from my perspective after decades of talking about Hollywood on CNN Entertainment Tonight and as a Hollywood Reporter columnist. Summer temps may be hitting 100 degrees plus, but Hollywood's hitting the brakes with a weak end that hammers home that summer's over for moviegoing. Expectations were modest for all three wide openings, Lionsgate's PG-13 thriller Fall, Gravitas Ventures' PG-13 dramedy Mac and Rita, and a 24's R-rated comedy horror thriller Bodies, bodies, bodies. Exits for Bullet Train, which Sony opened to $30 million last week, didn't point to great word of mouth. Critics were a grim 53% on Rotten Tomatoes, and audiences were a blah 77%. But with no big new competition, it's no surprise it wound up number one again in Weekend 2. What is surprising is seeing Paramount, Skydance, Media, and Tom Cruise's Top Gun Maverick spring back to life in Weekend 12, finishing third with way more ticket sales than any of the newcomers. On today's box office autopsy, we'll check out that quiet trio of openings. We'll look at what's ahead in the next few weeks, like Universal's R-rated thriller Beast and Sony and Screen Gems horror thriller The Invitation. And later in our Oscar Outlook Spotlight, we'll focus on Searchlight's Empire of Light and its gala screening set for October's London Film Festival. And we'll also catch up on the latest Golden Globes buzz. Let's start today with this quick scene from Fall, as two young women climb a 2,000-foot-high abandoned radio tower. What they find at the top is, what else? There's no way to get down. Okay, so just stay behind me, one wrong at a time. You're doing great. Becky, you gotta come up here. Hey, trust me. What was that? Media pundits weren't expecting much from fall, and that's what they got. After originally projecting three to five million, they cut it to one to two million. Exhibitors were two to four million. It wound up with two and a half million at fifteen hundred and forty eight theaters, placing tenth. Critics are only 71% for fall on Rotten Tomatoes, while audiences are just 78%, which won't help word of mouth. Meanwhile, back at the top of the chart, the bullet train to nowhere with Brad Pitt on board stayed in first place with $13.4 million at 4,357 theaters, down 55% in Weekend 2 with a domestic cum of $54.5 million, proving that it definitely helps not to have any new event films in the marketplace. Train's also done $60 million internationally, bringing its worldwide cum to $114.5 million. There was, however, a 12-week-old event film, 
Top Gun Maverick that took advantage of this extra quiet weekend to expand its run for a fan appreciation event from 2,760 theaters to 3,181, including many premium format screens that would otherwise be tough or even impossible to get for a film that opened May 27th. Maverick added 7.15 million, placing third and missing second place by just $20,000. Warner Brothers DC's DC League of Super Pets took second with 7.17 million in weekend three. Maverick's domestic cum is now $673.8 million on its way to overtaking Black Panther at $700.4 million. Getting back to the newcomers, we now know where the bodies, bodies, bodies are buried, and it's in eighth place at the box office with $3.3 million at 1,275 theaters. It had opened last weekend at just six cinemas. Earlier media projections were for four to six million and were then downscaled to two to three million. Exhibs were thinking three to five million. What could help is that critics are applauding bodies with 90% on Rotten Tomatoes, but its audience score is just 77%, which doesn't suggest great word of mouth. As for Mac and Rita, it's opening in 13th place to just 1.1 million at 1930 theaters showed moviegoers weren't making it a Big Mac. Hollywood handicappers were thinking about a $1 to $2 million opening, and it just hit the low end of that range. Critics are a grim 26% on Rotten Tomatoes, and audiences are also negative with 48%. But who knows, this story might still be for you, with a young woman on a wild Palm Springs weekend, awakening to find she's now 70 years old and looks like Diane Keaton. You can't be here. It's me. Ma'am, I'm serious. Okay. One more move and you get an eyeful of pepper. It's me, Mac. I grew up always feeling like I was an older woman trapped in the body of a little girl. I wrote a book. Matt, if you're not getting paid for something, it's a hobby, and hobbies are disgusting. And I did my darndest to keep my inner old gal to myself. Huh. We. Ra. Lee. Yes. We. Yes. yes. I thought it would be super fun if we all lie down and did a past life regression. What? You should go do it. We'll just meet back up at the house. Welcome. Lay down, Moonchild, and think about who you want to be. I'm a 70-year-old woman trapped in the body of a 30-year-old who just needs a minute to rest! Oh, oh my god! Somebody help me! This is not me! Looking ahead, there's more of the same low-profile horror and action product on the Hollywood horizon. Next weekend, we'll bring out thriller fans as Universal's R-rated Beast, starring Idris Elba, opens at about 3,500 theaters. The early media buzz is for an opening of 12 to $15 million, which, if it holds, will be a step up from this weekend. This scene with a lion attacking a man trapped under a safari jeep will help you decide if Beast's for you. Rotten Tomatoes critics are a deadly 29% on Beast. 
the best tracking demos are men under and over 25 who are both one point over norm. Women over and under 25 are scoring a bit lower, but they're also both one point over norm. So the Hollywood jungle drums really aren't beating loudly for Beast. Also arriving next weekend is Crunchyroll's PG-13 Japanese anime adventure Dragon Ball Superhero. Critics are applauding it on Rotten Tomatoes with an amazing early score of 100%, which should help get moviegoers' attention. Although this manga-based franchise goes back to 1986, this superhero episode is an original story, not a remake or sequel. Men under and over 25 are tracking in double digits for first choice, with younger men 8 points over norm and older men 6 points over norm. Women of all ages just don't care. Hollywood handicappers are projecting 10 to 15 million dollars at about 3,000 theaters, which could put Superhero in a close race for first place with Beast. The Horror Parade will be marching into cinemas again August 26th, when Sony and Screen Gems The Invitation opens at 2,500 plus theaters. The early media buzz is for a 10 to 12 million dollar launch. Here's a quick scene that will tell you if you want to see it or skip it. Has he been like this a lot? So agitated. Sometimes. Well, I'm glad he has you. It comforts me. I know he wants the best for you, too. I'm glad you're here, Kira. I think it's important. Can I ask you something? How has he been handling things? He can be self-destructive. I think he's doing the best he can. Looking at first choice tracking scores, only under 25 women are RSVPing for the invitation. It's early, but they're already scoring in double digits and are seven points over norm. Time now to turn from horror films to the horrors of another award season and plug in our Oscar Outlook Spotlight. As festivals keep revealing their schedules, Best Picture Oscar contenders keep emerging, the latest being Searchlight's Empire of Light. The R-rated romantic drama, written, directed, and co-produced by Sam Mendes, is not only world premiering in September at the 47th Annual Toronto International Film Festival, but is now set for a gala screening at the 66th BFI London Film Festival, running from October 5th through the 15th. It's the kind of one-two prime festival punch that puts a film on Academy members' must-see early lists. Light, opening December 9th, stars Olivia Coleman and Colin Firth. It's got enviable credentials to drive it in the awards spotlight. Mendes won the Best Directing Oscar and DGA in 2000 for his first film, American Beauty, which also won Best Picture. In 2020, he was Oscar nominated for 1917, for which he won the DGA. Coleman won the lead actress Oscar in 2019 for The Favorite. She got a supporting actress Oscar nom in 2021 for The Father, and a lead actress Oscar nod in 2022 for The Lost Daughter. Firth was an Oscar lead actor nominee in 2010 for A Single Man, and won the lead actor Oscar for The King's Speech in 2011. 
this combination of Oscar wins means Light, as one of ten Best Picture nominees, would likely have directing and acting noms to enhance its prospects. That would likely put it in the DGA and SAG races, where wins give a boost to Oscar's Best Picture contenders. Last, and definitely least, is today's HFPA update. After years as a Hollywood laughingstock, the HFPA just might get the last laugh. Recent conflicting reports claimed the group's Golden Globes, quote, will be back on NBC in 2023, or that it's, quote, not a done deal yet, or that the telecast is just, quote, hanging by a thread. As we're recording, no one really knows, but you may know by the time you hear this. Despite earlier media coverage that the HFPA is undiversified and may have been involved in past financial improprieties, the key issue seems to be whether the Hollywood publicists who initiated 2021's HFPA boycott are now prepared to work with the Globes. Buzz has been that some of them will hold their noses and do so because it suits their needs as Oscar campaigners. Having the Globes back on NBC next January would again be great timing to boost their clients' visibility to Academy voters. No other awards show emerged as a successor to these sidelined globes. The Critics' Choice Awards looked like it might, but a 2021 COVID surge delayed the event, aired on the CW Network and TBS, from January 9th to March 13th, and there was no snapping back from that. Those publicists ready to embrace the HFPA again are realists willing to do whatever it takes to win Oscar gold. Whether their A-list clients feel the same way remains to be seen. And that is it for today's podcast. Next week on Box Office Autopsy, we'll check out the openings of Sony's The Invitation and United Artists releasing at MGM's 3,000 Years of Longing. And, as always, we'll have our Oscar Outlook Spotlight shedding light on the award season. Please join us again then, and thanks very much for listening. Time now for our film flashback look at what was happening in Hollywood right around now, way back then. Let's set today's time travel dial for... August 15th, 1979. Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, which opened August 15th, 1979, almost didn't star Marlon Brando. Brando, cast as the rogue Green Beret Colonel Kurtz, leading hit-and-run missions from Cambodia against the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops, almost dropped out as filming began. He'd been advanced one million dollars, but threatened to quit and keep the money, to which Coppola said he'd then go after Jack Nicholson, Robert Redford, or Al Pacino. When Brando finally did show up late, he'd been drinking and was some 90 pounds overweight. He hadn't read the screenplay or Joseph Conrad's novella, Heart of Darkness, on which the film is based. After Brando did read the script by John Milius, Coppola, and Michael Herr, he refused to do it. Brando and Coppola argued for days about the dialogue before Brando agreed to work in a somewhat ad-lib style, and Coppola said he'd film him mostly in shadows. Coppola was stunned Brando had never read Conrad's book, and spent days on the set reading it to him. 
Conrad's Kurtz was tall and very thin, but Brando was just 5'7 and obese. Coppola compensated by shooting Brando from angles that didn't show his stomach. Originally, Apocalypse was to have been directed by George Lucas from a screenplay by Milius that Lucas had helped develop. Coppola, as executive producer, tried to get it made at Warner Brothers, which passed. Coppola then got busy directing The Godfather for Paramount. When Lucas and Coppola became A-list filmmakers and could get Apocalypse green-lighted, Lucas was busy directing the first Star Wars. Milius didn't want to direct Apocalypse, so Lucas agreed Coppola should do it. Milius's 1969 screenplay was called The Psychedelic Soldier, but he changed it to Apocalypse Now after seeing a 1960s hippies button that read Nirvana Now. Coppola also faced casting challenges with the role of Captain Willard, whose secret orders are to find and kill Kurtz. Al Pacino passed because he anticipated a five-month jungle shoot. It turned out to take 16 months. Coppola cast Harvey Keitel, but after shooting for two weeks, replaced him with Martin Sheen, who later suffered a heart attack during filming, which had to be kept secret to avoid having the American Zoetrope and United Artists production shut down. Steve McQueen passed on Willard after having first agreed when Coppola offered him $3 million. Realizing how long he'd be in the Philippine jungles, McQueen asked instead to play Lieutenant Colonel Kilgore, with much less location work, but for the same $3 million, a deal Coppola refused. The role then went to Robert Duvall, who ended up with a Supporting Actor Oscar nomination for his 11 minutes of screen time. And that's it for today's podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with another box office autopsy next week. In Hollywood for Screen Dollars, I'm Martin Grove.